name is uh, Jason J. Rock Houston, and you're listening to Chaotic Risk Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.chaoticrisk.com. Um, it's my great pleasure to be speaking with um, Dead Horse uh, Trauma Lead Singer um, Eric Davidson. How are you doing tonight, uh, Eric? I'm pretty good. And you're calling all the way from uh, Des Moines, Iowa, um, home of uh, Slipknot. Now, were those guys um, at all an influence on you? Oh, yeah. Well, certainly. We've been watching those guys since we're 15, 16 years old. Yeah, you know, um, in, in preparation talking to you, Eric, I don't know if you remember, you talk, uh, I talked to you uh, once before about two years ago, and um, during that interview, I was listening back to it, um, and I had asked you, hey, tell me a little bit about the name um, Dead Horse Trauma, how you guys came up with that, and you told me, well, it's kind of like um, when people take advantage of somebody, or they, you know, take advantage of a girl or something, or um, like how they, they uh, give, give fake news, and what, what kind of interested me about that is kind of... Um, the state of the world, you know, uh, this is an interview two years ago, and the state of the world, politics being what they are now, and the news, it's kind of um, interesting that you kind of um, almost had a, uh, you could almost look into the future there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, things have been spelled out for for generations, you know, there's like, you know, a lot of the, the methods and things they used to, yeah. to control people, Agenda 21, all of it's set out on the United Nations website, you know, for everybody to see. Yeah, you know, um, I, I don't know um, how old you are, but I tell you, when I was coming up, um, I remember once upon a time when the news media was, they just reported the news um, as it was, this is a story, this is um, how it happened, we're reporting it, and now it, it's kind of funny, because depending on which, uh, you know, news outlet you're watching, um, you can tell, um, you can tell which uh, way they go politically, you know, and it's, it's kind of funny to see what the media has turned into these days. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now let me ask you, um, how do you get treated by, um, you know, by the music, uh, rock, uh, media you feel when people, um, cover your band? Um, I mean, we, we do pretty well. I mean, we're, we're not, uh, signed to a major label or anything like that, so we're all just, um, pretty much on our own. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't get a lot of, um, same, the same respect you'd get from, from being to a, or from a big label like that, but, um, you know, I think for, for not having a label or anybody, corporate money or anything pushing us, I think people give us a lot of, um, you know, good coverage. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny you say that because um, I, I was just going to make that comment because, um, you know, um, I'm always seeing stuff about you guys all over the internet, all over Facebook. Like you said, um, I know you have like a little, I, I believe your own little street team where fans that kind of, kind of help um, promote the band. And so I think it's great that you guys are able to um, get that kind of, um, you know, reaction. And, and it, it also shows, you know, just how hard um, the band works at, um, you know, really, you know, putting the name of the band out there. I appreciate that. Yeah, and so um, I know you guys are getting ready to go on a um, European tour. Talk a little bit. Is that the first time you've ever um, played overseas, or have you been there before? No, this is, our, this is our first time ever. I mean, I'm literally sitting in front of my suitcase right now wondering what I need to pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're going with the Polish airline that uh, none of them really speak English. I mean, they, they had some people, but we've been trying to call for information, and <laughs> it's all... Uh, we have no idea what we can bring, what we can't bring, how much weight we can keep wow. in our bags, and all sorts of stuff. So we're trying to get that all figured out. It was in a pretty, pretty much a panic mode. We leave the day after tomorrow. Well, talk talk a little bit about the power of the internet. I, I'd imagine um, that being the case, that you know um, you're at least able to go on there and you know see what the weather there is like. And um, now um, it, that that must be kind of a culture shock, you know, uh, going from you know being being a you know an American band going overseas to Europe. Um, that's you know where you like you said English is not the um, main language. That's got to be a pretty pretty interesting experience there. That's what I hear. But a, a lot of uh, we toured with the band from from Hungary. There we came back and we're, we were asking them a lot of questions about it. But they said the majority of people over there in, in Europe speak English, so they should be okay. I mean, they had a lot of Hungarian music. They they converted everything over to English, so it was more you know accepted everywhere. And so, um, what is the label you guys are signed to again? I f I forgot. Um, we're not we're not signed to a label. Um, oh, not quite yet. We're we're working with the label that's we're kind of in, in, in negotiations with. They're actually going to provide us our our European release for, of our last album, Life. Okay. So we're going to have that taken care of. But as of right now, we're we're not signed to a label. So right now, you guys are independent. Which um, you know, the cool thing to me about that is, um, of course, if you have a bigger label behind you, there's a lot more um, of a financial backing. But at the same time, if you put your music out independently. You don't have a guy, you know, up in an office in a suit telling you, you know, I don't hear a hit here. Go back and, you know, write something a little more radio friendly. And, and at the same time, you know, you're able to put your music out there the way you guys want to put it out there. And, you know, if it's a big hit and it sells, then, um, you know, more money goes into the band as opposed to having to um, 
a deal where the record company makes more money than the band, you know? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, as far as financial backing, that usually means that they provide the money for you that you can pay back. At, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like a bank loan, yeah, yeah. And so, um, are, are you guys... Um, are you guys getting ready to release a, a, a new CD, or have you already released it? We're re-releasing our, our album Life over in Europe. Oh, okay. So it's about one year, just about since we released it here in the United States, so it'll be one year later over there in, in Europe. And then we are in the, currently in the in the pre-production process of uh, working on a brand, brand new album. Oh, so that, that's pretty cool. I mean, because like you said, this album came out here like a year ago, and then um, people in Europe are hearing it just for the um, very first time, so it's all new to them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so after the European tour, um, do you think you will tour here in the States, or will you go back to working on um, some uh, new music? Um, all of the above, man. We, we're already, we already have another tour booked with our friends in Lydia Can't Breathe. They're from oh. Central Florida. Okay. Uh, if you haven't heard of those guys, they're, they're awesome. No, definitely have to out. check them out. Um, I haven't heard of them, but um, wow, well. So now let me ask you, um, you said you've already been working on some uh, new music. Um, for the next album, have you recorded anything? Or are you guys just in the writing stages? We're in the recording of our writing stages. Like we do a pre-production, a pretty intense pre-production session with our, our producer Rick Lander. Okay. He's at a Crisis Lab Studios. Um, what he does is he, we, we go through and record kind of like what we want the song to sound like and what what it's going to be, uh-huh. and then have that all ready to go. Then we can we're going to play some of it live, do it, you yeah. know through a couple tours, and then um, we'll go right into recording mode probably about the end of July. And now let me ask you, when you when you go out there and you kind of, um, I guess that's a good way to test test potential new material, um, but what's that like, like you go out on stage and you play a tune nobody's ever heard of, I mean, um, do, do they still um, get just as excited about the old tunes that they're familiar with? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's been a big thing, I mean, we, we've been a local band, you know, kind of a regional band for so long, yeah. that, you know, we, you kind of get your friends and everybody kind of knows the music, but the true test of like, you know, whether you have decent music or not, yeah. is to go out in front of a brand new audience where nobody knows who you are. Yeah, 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 and then to that's a true test, yeah. Like kind of, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, because I, I guess that makes sense, because if you, if you go, you know, to a place where you know you're very popular... Um, you know, you're, it's kind of like you're among your among your people, among your friends, so to speak, um, the loyal fan yeah, base. They're invested in liking you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, now we mentioned Slipknot uh, at the top interview. I was wondering, um, when you were growing up, who were some of the other bands or um, even singers who um, influenced you to do what you're doing? Oh man, actually, uh, one huge influence was uh, Cameron Heacock from American Head Charge. Oh, okay. Um, he was. A, I looked up to him quite a bit, and still, still do. And then uh-huh. we, we had a chance to do a little bit of a tour with him and um by the end of it you know i i finally worked up the guts by the end of the t- the, the tour to come up and ask him if he wanted to come up and do a song with us and he was like yeah i don't know i'll we'll think about it you know so i was like okay you know no worries and then at the very last day we were in des moines and he, he came up to me and said hey you still want to do that song I was like yeah absolutely so he, he came up there and on stage with us did a did a song it's on youtube it's oh. called disbelief but oh wow yeah wow. he ended up doing the song with us it was pretty awesome to have like you know one of my biggest influences up there on the stage with us okay wow and so now um you mentioned that um that you're releasing the um album for the first time in um europe which is why you guys are getting ready to go over there um i was curious um will this be the same version that was released here in america will it be any um, bonus tracks or anything extra that the american fans didn't get um the artwork's going to be a little bit different but pretty much it's the, the same album okay. um, we, we we get put everything into it that we could. We didn't like really hold anything back on this album. Uh-huh. We did start. We did have a couple uh, B sides and things that we ended up kind of reforming into into brand new songs. Oh, that's cool. And now let me ask you, Eric. Um, being that you're the singer, are you the primary songwriter of the band, or does everybody contribute to the songwriting? Uh, everybody contributes to the songwriting as far as you know their instrument. I mean, right now, yeah. before it was you know when we first started out, you know we, we would all contribute ideas. You know, yeah. I do a lot of guitar stuff, and um, you know even our first EP, like I pretty much wrote all that stuff except for the drums okay the, uh, now i mean we have musicians that you know I, my guitar player plays guitar you yeah. know really well like a lot the, the, the intention is to get them a lot better than i could you yeah, know yeah. So, we actually have a guitarist playing the guitar and everything so yeah everybody writes their own parts um you know everybody has influence yeah. over that and, and now let so me ask you on that front so okay. um you said you played the guitar i was curious um like a lot of uh, musicians, I'm, I'm assuming, did you start out as a guitar player and you became a singer later, or were you always um, a singer for as long as you played? Yeah, I was always a, a, I played guitar since I was 11 years old, but I was always a, a shower singer, you know? Yeah, yeah. I always 
reason I asked that is the reason I asked that is because I know guys like Dave Mustaine. You know, they start out as um, as lead players, and then when they went on to form their own bands, for example, I've heard Dave talk about how the fact that you know I, I was originally going to get a another uh, lead singer to, um, for Megadeth, but I couldn't get anybody to um, you know sing my songs the way I heard them in my head. <laughs> and I was kind of curious: is that kind of your story? Where you yeah, know, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, I started Dead Horse Trauma as I was going to play guitar uh-huh. and I was going to find a singer. And then a uh, drummer at the time, when I was playing guitar and bass, uh-huh. and then, you know, I was just like, I'm just going to lay down some vocal stuff. And, yeah. you know, because this is kind of, we want to find a singer that does it like this, kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> and we laid it down. He was just like, why don't you do it? And I'm like, I don't know. And, uh, and what was that feeling like? Because um, probably like a lot of guys, uh, like you said, you thought of yourself as a shower singer, a guy that really... Um, could sing in your own mind, and then you have other guys telling you, you know, the band, hey, you've got a pretty distinct singer, why don't you just, um, you know, sing? Yeah, it was, I don't know, it was kind of uh, petrifying at first. Yeah, and, and, and on, on that note, i got to ask, um, did it take you a while? You know, of course, it's one thing being in a recording studio where you're kind of with the guys in your band, and it's just you and the band, uh, and maybe a producer, what, an engineer, or whatever, but, um, you know, getting up on stage when you're used to just, um, you know, strumming that guitar, um, for the very first time what was that experience like did, did it take you a while to get used to first of all hearing your voice back you know um in the speakers and that you know live on stage and and knowing everybody's oh, looking yeah. at you <laughs> it's still it's still a progressive thing I'm, I'm still learning how to sing and and getting all that stuff right um, mic techniques there's yeah. so, so many things that go into it you know and at the very first show you know i had no idea there was even some such thing as monitors to hear yourself yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah and, and let me ask you on that and that note i was curious um like um, like anybody heard um, Dead Horse Trauma, you're, you're like um, like the guys told you, you know, you're a pretty decent singer. Now I, I got to ask you though, did it take you um, did it take you a while to get used to? Hey, I'm the front man. I'm the guy friend of the band. You know, when we're on stage, uh, most I, most uh, people in the audience they're looking at what I'm doing. Did it take me a while to, to realize that? Or? Well, get, you know, get used. To, you know, because like, like again, you know, going from a guy that just um, was a lead player maybe or whatever for. Uh, most of his life and you know now you're the front man you're the main guy in the band you're the one doing all the lead vocals i mean um you know a little more attention's on you than if you were just the lead player if you know what i mean yeah there was a lot of pressure i mean uh, the first time but i mean it was mostly it was a uh, practice you know we practiced quite a bit you know especially even before our first show yeah you know, we just had a really good practice schedule of trying to but you know the, the idea was to practice so you can't get it wrong yeah you know, yeah and I, you know, I'm not a musician myself, so I, that's why I got all the respect for guys like you that get up there and do what you do. But um, also, a lot of guys have told me that it's it's difficult to um, play guitar and sing at the same time, especially if you're a lead singer. Um, did that? Did the art of being able to do that? Did it take a while to master that? I know I, I don't play guitar on the stage. Oh, yes, I just play. Oh, okay, okay. I just do the vocal thing. But that that was part of the, the music writing. You oh, know, I hear. Oh, so, you for know. the songwriting. Okay, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, and um, and, and um, is that part of the reason, like like you said on stage, you don't um, play guitar, you just kind of rather um, keep it simple? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm the vocalist, and we have to, uh, a lead guitar player and a rhythm guitar player, they kind of switch off. Oh, okay. Rhythms, okay. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I always loved, um, I always loved bands that had, um, you know, two, two guitar players. I, 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 think, I always felt like it just made the, the sound of a band, you know, a little more fatter. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and let me ask, as far as guitar players, you know, um, who were some of your favorite guitar players when you were coming up? Oh man, I, I pretty much I stuck to studying the guitar players that played really easy stuff that I could figure out, like Nirvana, you oh. know, that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. And um, I wasn't really into yeah. it for the technicality. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Side of it. Now, now see, it's interesting you say that because um, I came I came up like in the seventies and eighties, where um, back in those days, you know, um, almost every band had. Um, had like the ultimate guitar hero. That's one thing I really think that is, um, you know, missing these days. Um, and I was kind of curious, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of guitar solos. I mean, there are some yeah. some things. I mean, we we kind of experiment a little bit on the new album, you know, with with soloing and things like yeah, that yeah. too. And just to kind of change I guess, things. I guess it. But, de- uh, yeah, I guess it depends on um, you know when, when you grew up and what type of um, you know music you're into. But but for example, you know. Um, I, just just to set an example, or I take a band like you know maybe Judas Priest. I mean uh, KK uh, Downing, Glenn Tipton. I mean they were like the ultimate guitar team, you know. See, I was never really like a huge 
metal fan. Metal fan, I guess. Oh. I, I came from from like Cypress Hill. Oh, like rap, okay. okay, stuff okay. like that to getting into Marilyn Manson and then. Oh, um, okay, okay. That's you know things like that. Rob Zombie. That's kind of, let me ask you, Eric. Uh, when you guys um, like write a song, let's say you're getting ready to go in the studio, um, would everybody typically already have songs written to kind of present, or um, like do you jam the songs out as, as you're in the studio? See, we we, uh, we do a lot of writing um, before you, online. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, we, you know, our, our two guitars live together, so they got a studio at their house. So basically, they can, you know, write everything there, send it over to Garrett in Indiana, who can uh, put the drums to it, okay. you know, kind of thing. Send it to Houston, Texas, to our bassist, and he, you know, lay, lays down his bass parts, and they can have an entire song ready for me to lay down vocals to. Oh, wow, wow. Okay. And so, um, I guess, like you said, uh, the day after tomorrow, you're getting ready to leave for um, Europe. Where's the first stop on the tour? Uh, Dusseldorf, Germany. Oh wow, wow! Have you ever been? Have you been ever uh, been to that part of Germany before? No, nope, I've been to uh, South America uh, three times, and that's about it. Okay, so what's after Europe? I mean, when you come out, um, is there going to be a U.S. tour or? Yeah, oh. yeah, the, yeah, we call it the Barrel of Laugh Tour. It's at dhttour.com. We have all of our dates up there. Okay, yeah, now, I love that. Awesome. Lydia can't yeah. breathe. Um, I, I love that title for simple fact. I've always been I've also a guy who's always been into comedy. I, I um, one of these guys believe you know like uh, music. I say is the universal language, but I also say comedy is the best medicine. You know, for people when they're going through a hard time, uh, if you can make somebody laugh or uh, you know tell a funny joke or something, I think that's cool. So talk a little bit about how you titled the tour of that. Well, we have what? So oh, we uh. We, we showed us Lady Can't Breathe a couple times, and we always have so much fun. You yeah. know, it's, it's always like, you know, we we go to the show, you know, during the show and everything, everybody's having a great time. I mean, I don't know if you've seen Lady Can't Breathe, but they they have a lot of stuff to their show that they put out. They throw out peanut butter sandwiches into the crowd. Oh, wow. They, uh, How cool is that? They do a bunch of stuff. It was not called, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's like peanut butter jelly time or something like that. Okay, well, do you guys ever um, pull pranks like that um, among yourselves or among um, any of the bands that you've played with over the years? We prank every band we tour with at the very last show. Oh, okay. And, so, yeah, we and do this, stuff like that all the time. And so, um, this is something that you guys know about that the other bands are, let's just say, they're, they're less surprised until the, until the time comes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, oh. The, some bands like Lydia Can't Breathe know to expect it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do it like two days before or something to try to sneak it in there. Wow, wow, wow. And um, what's the funniest thing you've ever. Um, you know, experienced on the road. I mean, be it with uh, one of your bandmates or even an um, interaction you've had with a fan or something like that. Oh, jeez, I can't even can't even think of one right now. There's so many tour yeah. stories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing that you're just getting different stimulus every single night. Yeah. You know, every place that you're going, like you're seeing different things. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's really hard to remember like crazy tour stories. Okay, speaking of that, I was curious. Do you ever like? Um, I've talked to people who've told me that that they've actually like. Played, played a city and they, they they've been on tour so long they forget they forget what town they're in is that anything like that ever happened to you absolutely I, at my my tech at, <laughs> at, right before the right before I go on the stage he brings me my set list to make sure that yeah. I've got all the stuff that like the sponsors and things that we want to thank yeah. and he, at the very top he has what city we're in and what the venue is called I think it's one time I had the, the venue wrong I was like oh, oh wow. yeah and, I can remember what it was but and speaking of set lists I was curious do you guys tend to like play the same uh, set of songs every night or like do you have an alternating set or anything like that we, we usually keep uh, one set per tour we try to keep things tight you know so that way it's you know exactly how much time it's going to take if you play the same songs in the same way yeah. every night okay and so like um, when you do come up with a set list like do you sit down with the rest of the band or uh, and say okay this is you know, what, what songs do you guys want to play or is it more of well, okay well I'm the singer so I'm going to kind of decide what I have ability to sing <laughs> No, there's a lot of there's a lot of different factors that go into that. It's actually a really good question. Um, well, see, some of our songs are in A tuning and some of our songs are in C tuning. Okay. So a lot of the songs have to be paired together so my guitarists aren't running like if we can't do an A C A C A C or they're running back and forth like putting their guitar away, grabbing another guitar, pulling it back out. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's two guitars at once, and we only have one tech. So you know, in order to keep the right guitar in everybody's hand and stuff like that, we try to bunch them together. So we'll do like a few A songs, a few C songs. And then there's um, my vocal ability, and you know I do a lot of things in different ranges. Yeah. Um, 
so some songs we can't play at the very beginning of the set because my, my voice isn't quite um, stretched out yet. You know, some songs are like meant for the end of the set. Some songs only only we can play at the beginning because yeah, my yeah. voice is too thrashed to, to sing them at the end of the set. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of different factors that go into it, you know, depending on all of our instruments. Yeah, you know, talk a little bit about the, um, you know, the, the live experience. Uh, I mean, I, I read stuff on lines where um, a lot of bands, they don't like when... Um, they don't like people holding up their phones to take pictures and that and, and flashing pictures what, when you're up on the stage or filming the band show. How do you feel about stuff like that? Man, I, I, as long as people are enjoying the show, I don't care if they have their cell phones out, I don't care what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. some people enjoy it, yeah, you yeah. know, enjoy the show that way. Yeah. You know, some people have emergencies going on and you can't, like, completely consume them into things. I mean, it's kind of a... It, it's kind of cool, you know, when people are like, man, I was having so much fun, I forgot to, you know, pull my phone out or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep everybody's attention. That's kind of your, your deal, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, now, um, where are some of your favorite, um, as far as the U.S., where are some of your favorite um, towns to players, you know, places? Man, probably uh, well, Des Moines, Iowa. Absolutely. Uh, always has a soft spot. I mean, it's kind of where our people that have been around for, for 12 years have have seen us um uh -huh. idaho falls idaho is a major market for us houston texas wow, wow. um los angeles california it's really cool to have like a bunch of you know yeah. musicians that you respect come out and see you and stuff like that yeah. um melbourne florida has always been pretty cool and now let me ask you because um you're, you're mentioning that um that, that you you're never really much of a um metal fan growing up but i was kind of now a lot of people think of your band as a metal band but um you know, how, how do you feel about being labeled a metal band, or, or how would you describe the overall sound of your band? See, we're, we're, we try to break that, I mean, when people say metal, yeah. you know, they're thinking, you know, devil horns up, and, you yeah, know, stuff crazy like, yeah. stuff. it's really hard to get into that yeah. other scene of, like, yeah. you know, people that are into pop, and, like, yeah, yeah. you know, we, we kind of have, a, a common thing that we have coming up is, like, people walk up, they're like, I don't even like that kind of music, but you guys did that really well, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, we, we like to get that kind of thing, so we try to... We try to minimize the, the metal look, and we yeah. call ourselves a rock band. We're a metal band disguised as a rock band. Yeah, it, it's funny because you know, um, I think the the name um, plays a factor in that. You know, um, you know, being that your band named Dead Horse Trauma, it kind of um, has Absolutely. a bit of an aggressive yeah. overtone to it. Um, and yet, at the same time, when people listen to the music, it might not be totally what they expect. You know, and then being that your name Dead Horse Trauma again, that doesn't. Just um, saying the name, it doesn't sound like what you'd expect a pop band, a pop band to be named. You know, it's, so it's uh, funny you say that. <laughs> I mean, that, it's actually that, that's a, affected a few of our shows. Like the, the promoter doesn't do their research, so uh -huh. they do Dead Horse Trauma, obviously Deathcore. Yeah. You know, so they'll book us with a bunch of these really heavy, like hardcore bands. And then you guys, and we'll go up there like the Backstreet Boys, yeah. singing radio songs, yeah. and they're like, oh man, you know, this is what we thought. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you ever, because of the band's name, I was curious. Um, have you ever um, had any like um, people protest the group or in there or say anything about oh um, th this is a band yeah. against animals? That's funny you mention that. We have actually had one protester in Las Las Vegas wow. come out. And wow, wow. It was weird. I was like, what? What are you doing? He was like, I don't know. I'm protesting some band or something. I don't know a church they, or something they, like they, that. They kill horses or something. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'd imagine. But you know, that's a thing. Like I said, um, the name. It's just a cool sounding name. You know, first of all, I think. Um, like, like I gotta be honest. When I when I came across your guys' Facebook page, I, man, that's a cool sounding name. I gotta just the name alone. I want to check the band out. You know, nice. Yeah, and, and uh, we we talked a little bit about the name last time I talked here. But um, did did you yourself come up with the band name or? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. That that's that's cool. Um, and, and now um, talk about some of the band. I mean, you mentioned some of the bands you've toured with, but um, like. Um, do you typically um, like? Uh, do, do they typically book you with metal bands, or does it just kind of um, depend where you're playing? Um, we, we have a we're with a booking agency called the NBA Booking or NBA Music Group. Okay. I think they just got absorbed by Satellite Touring, okay. which is a much heavier type yeah. of uh, booking agency. They have a lot of, of you know, heavier bands on that. Uh -huh. um, but before, oh, excuse me. As NBA Music Group, um, you know, we had a, a good influence on that. We you know one of the the guy who owns that's one of my best friends. Okay. Um, you know, so he lets us do whatever we want. So if there's a band we want to tour with and things like that, you know, well, he'll go for it and approach him. And um, so we actually toured with uh, Era Nine. It was kind of a wow a non metalish type of band. I don't know yeah. if you've heard of them. They're from Canada. No, I have to check them out. Um, um, anyways, um, let me ask you. Um, now as far as um touring goes like you are you guys at the point where um do, do you ever um do do you typically do a lot of headlining shows or 
is it mostly opening for other bands at this point? Um, we're trying to open for bands that are bigger than us. You oh, know, there you go. Of, Makes so sense, we're, yeah. We're at a point where there's, there's a, you, you can only grow so far. And, yeah. And then when, so you have to tour with a band that's bigger than you. Yeah, yeah. You start makes... to get a little bit of draw. Like, they'll bring yeah. people out to the shows, and then the true test is the next time when you come back headlining, how many of those people are going to come out to see you? You know, yeah. so we, we're at that point where we've headlined pretty much every tour that we've had for a while. I mean, the, the last time we, we had a band, you know, that, that we toured with that, um, you know, was able to, or that they kind of took the headlining spot, um, it was like Moto Grader. Well, so, okay, okay. You know, they've, they've been around for a while and they, they, you know, they did a really awesome job. Um, but then after that, or even our second tour ever, yeah. right, we are doing the West Coast and we didn't know, like, you know, we were just, it was our first time out touring, so we didn't quite have an idea how this worked. Yeah, yeah. And so we went and headlined and there was like nobody at the shows because yeah. nobody knew who we were, you know? Yeah, yeah. So like, we've, we've paid our dues in that kind of aspect of playing in front of the, the, the bartender and, you know, the owner is sitting there tapping his foot waiting for us to get done, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, Motor Gator, they're, they're an interesting band because, they, like you said, they've been around for years and they're starting to make a little bit of a comeback. I know, I think it was last year, they recently signed with um, David Elfson's record label, EMP Label Group. And, um, yeah. So, so they're going going again. That's, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, talking a little bit about the internet, um, I was curious, you know, you, I'm sure you always have people... Um, you know, messaging you on Facebook and sending you guys emails and stuff. It must be kind of a, a unique feeling when um, you get somebody send you a message or something about loving the band or whatever, and it's in a place that maybe you guys even haven't, you know, stepped foot in yet or played live, but somebody's halfway around the world, they're checking your band out. Yeah, I mean, it's always a great feeling. Yeah, yeah. Um, we get messages all the time. We just got one a little bit ago, you know, asking... I'm sure one of his friends in, is in a band. He's like, "Hey, next time you're here, you should, you should um, ask this band to come play with you." <laughs> wow, wow, wow! And you're like, well, so I'm like, all right, cool." That's not exactly how it works. We're always looking for good, you know, local bands that are in the area that can help, um, you know, with the promotion and stuff like that. Because I mean, you can even if you're Slipknot, you know, if nobody knows that you're coming, nobody's going to come to the show. You yeah, know? yeah, so yeah. It's kind of like you know, we look for for bands that, that can kind of help us with promotion in some areas. You know, being a DIY band, we don't have a lot of money dumped into radio promotion, that kind of stuff. And even, even then, like, who listens to the radio yeah, yeah. anymore, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's funny you say that, because a lot of kids these days, they listen they listen to stuff on the internet, internet radio stations, or even just stuff um, played on the band's official websites or whatever. And then, you know, it's kind of sad, because as great as technology is, you know, I was, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was in a local Best Buy the other day, and... Um, the guy's like, hey, is there anything I can help you find, sir? There's usually a great, at least, uh, section of all the new releases. He's telling me, because, you know, come July, Best Buy is no longer going to be selling um, CDs, but we'll be able to get, um, order stuff for you online still. And I'm like, man, that's that's very sad, because a lot oh, of yeah. kids, you know, here in the United States have no idea what a record store is, let alone a record. <laughs> um, Best Buy is like one of the few last places where you could actually buy CDs. I, I just think it's such a shame that they're trying to kill that technology because I'm a guy that still loves old a CD in my hand read who wrote the song look, the, look at the artwork I mean I remember when I was a kid I got Number of a Beast by Iron Maiden picked that up and man I didn't even know nothing about the band just because the way that what was on the album cover I wanted to buy it you know <laughs> yeah 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 and you know how do you feel about digital music versus you know physical um, CDs I don't know they both have pros and cons you yeah. know I mean we're I'm all about the uh, the business side of it and yeah. trying to find out what people like to buy. Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't care if they're buying it on a physical album or if they're, you know, we, we recently I started selling uh, jump drives, you know, okay. with their entire discography on it. Oh, cool. So, you know, you can pick that up at, the, at our merch table, things like that, and have every song that we've ever released, you know, and, and some stuff that we've never released. Oh, um, so who, let me, that's like kind of a unique thing. I, I mean, it's a new technology, like it, it's a, I don't know why more, more bands haven't thought about it, but I mean, there's the ability I know to buy a lot of stuff digitally like you said online but um as far as your band who came up with that idea because it's a pretty cool thing i think that was actually provided by scott um as a friend of ours as he worked at a um medicinal marijuana um okay okay a company called uh, caviar gold and when we got in our, our accident we got in a, a vehicle totaling accident that to took out our van it took out our trailer oh how long ago start fresh how long ago was that uh, i think it was early 2016 oh wow wow and so let me ask you, um, uh, um, I wasn't aware of it, but um, now that you brought it up, um, how serious was the accident? And, um, did anybody get seriously hurt or like, was it mostly just the equipment got damaged or? No, luckily it was 
just our vehicle and our trailer. I mean, it, it totaled our van. Um, look, none of us got hurt. I mean, a couple of the guys, our, our Jason, our drummer, had like some scars on his hands yeah. from. Uh, we have wood bunks, and they kind of just his hand slid across it. So we got a couple wow. of blisters, but that was basically it. And did you guys kind of, um, as they say, did you feel at the time like you saw your life flash before your eyes, or I mean, was it that? Absolutely. Wow. wow. Yeah, it was. It was a real real awakening moment for all of us like we we all got out and hugged each other like dude we're alive like this, yeah. this could have been really bad like yeah. this is pretty serious you know yeah and let me ask you um like when you guys got in the accident i was just curious like um like did you see the other vehicle coming towards you or did you even did it just kind of happen and and you realize what happened after the fact no yeah nobody really seen it there was a couple of people um we saw it was, it was basically what happened is we were, we were traveling in a really loaded down vehicle and yeah. you can never tell how long it's going to take you to stop wow, wow. um it was there was a, a semi in front of us and we thought we had plenty of room wow. but the semi was empty so the, the semi when it stopped yeah. somebody pulled out right in front of the semi the semi slammed on its brakes wow. and then when it slammed on its brakes it came almost to an instant stop and we just we just like you know uh, we tried to stop and i just heard seth say we're gonna hit you know wow. something like that so i put my head up against this uh this uh, up against the bunk and then bam we hit and it didn't it didn't hurt any of us luckily and, and that, that is the lucky thing now let me ask you after you guys were in that crash how did that um put the band out of business for a while or did you um did you get right back on the road we got we got going um before the tow truck could even get there i had my laptop out i, was, I started making a website of you know basically an sos to see if anybody could help us out with um you know donations um we had another shirt that we were going to release, so we ended up putting that out. And um, they took us to our, our tow yard. Wow. And so we, we went to the tow yard. I hooked up to their Wi-Fi. And within 24 hours, we had enough money raised to to buy a new van. How, and so, how, how amazing is that? Wow. And, and again, I mean, that just goes to show you the, the power the music has to bring people together, you know? Yeah. Our, even our home, uh, Des Moines Register, our, our newspaper here put out, uh, you know, it was on the... It was on the front page. Wow. Something about like you know this touring band from from here in Des Moines just got in this severe accident. Wow. And then um, I went to sleep. Basically, we we got a lead on uh, a couple vans on Craigslist. Okay. So we're just trying to find a, a a van that we could pack everything in there and then just sit up. We we got pretty spoiled, you know. We're yeah. we're in a a Sprinter van with with six bunks in it. Yeah. And um. Yeah, so all of us can lay down, you know, while we're driving, things like that. We have a trailer in the back which has all our equipment in it and, and merch and everything uh, like that. Yeah. Um, I gotta give a shout out to, to Jason White from Straight Line Stitch, like because of him and the way he taught us to to pack our trailer and yeah, everything. That was my um, yeah, that was my next question. Um, did you guys learn anything about how, the proper way to pack versus um, the way you oh, pack? Yeah. Yeah. Our very first tour was a Straight Line Stitch, and that was, our, our our trailer was a mess. Like after the first time, we pulled our equipment out, put it back in. We had bags we didn't need, all sorts of crazy stuff. And Jason comes over there and just like, man. Wow. You're gonna have to do some things. So he's like, "Come here, come here, let me show you." And so he showed us their trailer. <laughs> yeah. And they've been touring for like ten years, you know. Yeah, yeah. So he showed us their trailer and why stuff was there, and I was like, "Man, that's a really good idea." So we ended up, you know, learning a lot from them. You know, they taught us quite a bit as far as like tour etiquette with other bands, and mm -hmm. you know, we're just a baby band that never, never even knew that we we're gonna tour for a little while, so we didn't really have much research into it. And wow, wow. you know, we learned a lot from him. Oh, because, wow. of, because of that, when we got in that accident, our, all of our merch absorbed all the impact from from everything, and none of our equipment got even even harmed. Like you couldn't even tell. Amazing. So, um, so is it safe to say that the the van got the majority of the damage? I mean, how, how lucky is that that the equipment at least didn't get damaged? Yeah, it was it was nuts. The the trailer pretty much bent in half. Wow. It was all messed up, and all the equipment slammed into the front of it, but. The, all the merch absorbed the, the shock of it. We had a bunch of boxes at the time. So, so and, what was uh, the process as far as like um, unloading all that um, equipment and the merch from the twisted mangled bus? Oh man, yeah. So we got everything unloaded. We got um, took out as much as we can. They they got a record to grab our trailer and another record to grab our van. They took us to a record yard and um, they just basically just said like, yeah, there's no way we can fix this. This is um, this is total for sure. Wow, wow. So like, okay. So we started pulling everything that we could out of there. Luckily, um, Billy Flat, an awesome promoter out of Lewiston, Idaho, wow. um, she was, it was, her show was the next day. So we were on our way to her house. And so she came, picked us up with her, her blazer, 
we packed everything that we could into there and then I got a hold of the other band we were on tour with they're the, a band called Chrysalis out of, out of California oh, okay. Barstow, California wow wow so they, they come in and they had a lot of extra room so we yeah. packed everything that we could into their uh, RV and trailer and then we took it all over to Billy's house. So then we're sitting there. We, we have two bands and two bands worth of equipment yeah, wow. in, in one house. So me and Billy and uh, our mechanic, Brian, he's our bass player, um, we took off to go to Seattle to check out a van just wow. on, on a whim. We had to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> took a five-hour drive in order to make it back. Wow. And wow. That's, a, that's a story in itself. We ended up meeting this craigslist guy he was just high on crack he was trying to take our money like he was he was crazy he ended up chasing that chasing after us because i didn't want to buy a stupid van wow wow it started overheating it was terrible what? we ended up wasting five hours wow. driving and then five hours back and so talk about the back. van you ultimately replaced it with you know what was that experience like um the same thing it, it was the next day pretty much we, we ended up going get, getting that um that was the one, one out of this entire accident that was the one show that we missed wow, and it's because wow. I we got back we spent so much time with this guy um, we ended up going back and, and pulling in like it was midnight by the time we got there they are just like everybody's waiting to see if we're going to play or not yeah. and they, they were all waiting at the venue ready to go so they, wow. just in case wow and it, it's kind of it's kind of interesting though um, the fact that a van could get that um, mangled and that nobody got, seriously got hurt or you know even killed yeah 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 wow and now let me ask before we wrap this up, um, Eric. So what's what's the plan for the rest of 2018? Now you have this European tour, and then um, do you think we'll get a new album this year, or that probably the new album probably come out um, 2019? I, I think it's it's a lot more feasible to say uh, 2019. Or we're, we're, the target for this album is January 1st of 2019. So oh. we're hoping to get all this stuff done okay. as far as like you know the recording process and uh -huh. everything, and, and come out swinging in 2019 when we get this done. Well, and now, um, do you guys have like what I would call a dead horse trauma um, vault, so to speak, where like uh, like when you come out of the studio, do you ever have a ton of um, you know material recorded that didn't get used that you kind of put away for future use or something like that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think on this album we started with forty-seven songs, and wow. then we ended up narrowing it down to ten. Now that that's got to be that's got to be hard. Now, um, what does it come down to as far as choosing those? Uh, 10 songs, I mean, does everybody in the band kind of get a vote, or is it a matter of, like, um, you know, what you can sing and what you can't sing? No, it's it's more of a, uh, we, we were working with a producer, uh -huh. and, um, you know, he is very musically inclined. Um, he helped us from, I mean, basically up until the last album, we've been doing things ourselves with our, our friend um, and producer, Donnie Mangmaster. Okay. Um, he ended up moving to Colorado, so, wow. you know, out of necessity, we started, trying to look for somebody else to work with and this guy followed us around for three states wow. you know the first time he came up to, he came up and was like hey you know i got a studio i want you guys to you know check it out here's some stuff that i've done and i was like yeah yeah cool you know because everybody and their grandmother has a studio so I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's another guy who has a studio i get it you know so yeah, here yeah. comes in another state like hey you know like i never got a call from you or anything like that it gave me my card i'm like yeah i know a lot of people give me their cards you know but that, that we weren't necessarily looking to make an album right then yeah. you know so the second time he came and um you know we talked a little bit more i heard some of his stuff you know he was really really pushing on he wanted us he he liked our sound um the very first the first time we, we saw us we were a straight line stitch he wanted to record straight line stitch wow, wow. And the second they walked in there and he saw us open up he's like no nah, i dropped the whole straight line stitch idea i want to record you guys like this is this is the sound i'm going for oh that's that's and, amazing now and how big of a um input would you say that producer had on um that on your guys' overall sound? Um, a lot. I mean, that, that was part of the deal is um, to turn over, uh, like, you know, complete control uh -huh. to somebody else that, you know, is a lot more knowledgeable uh -huh. on the fact. Like, we've been doing everything ourselves, you know, kind of guiding it, you know, to the best of our ability. But, like, being being nobody's in the music industry, you kind of yeah. have to have to turn it over to somebody who's worked with, you know, you yeah. know uh, big names in the yeah, industry. Yeah. The music industry, what's that these days? Any, anyways, but, you know, um, <laughs> did, did you feel um, it helps to have an outside ear? As opposed to like um, having you or somebody else in the band uh, produce the record. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. I'm, I love to learn things and yeah. to to learn, you know, music theory. There's a lot of things that we we overlooked as a band yeah. that we didn't really even know. Like when you go from a major major C scale to yeah. dropping dropping to A tuning, you yeah. know, a lot of those scales don't work anymore. You know, you can't just yeah. just do that kind of thing. A lot of things can be brought to C, you know, from anywhere yeah. else, which is no big C major scale. You can pretty much play any scale in, but when you get to A, you have a very select few that you can yeah. get to. And we had no idea about that, so a lot of our songs sounded just like absolute garbage. You know, when we start playing them, 
coming. And so we had to rewrite a lot of stuff. Yeah, and we, we, yeah. could, we had, would have no idea why until, you know, yeah. um, Rick, Rick stepped in and kind of fed us the knowledge we needed in order to kind of keep continuing. And does he kind of have the final say as far as, like, um, if there's an argument like band members about um, what songs end up on the album, does he kind of um, get the final vote, so to speak, like, like for tiebreaker? What? <laughs> we don't really have those kind of issues. I mean, there's a, there's a pecking order, yeah. you know, for sure. So it's not like a, we, we're not a democracy. Oh, okay, that, that, that's good. We'd, we'd rather things being, instead of being pulled in five different directions, yeah. kind of is in a linear form, you know. So it's, that, that, that's never really been an issue. And generally on that type of situation, that the producer would, would be that's the one, you know, the guy with the most knowledge we want making the decisions on that thing. Yeah, but ultimately, yeah. it's, it's us that's going to pay the bill, you know. Yeah, so yeah. We're, and Dead Horse Farm, you guys were formed, what, in 2006? Um, I think, yeah, 06 is probably the first time we've ever started, or I think that first EP was probably released then. Wow, wow, so you guys are, you guys are, um, been around a while now, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty good now, um, let me ask you as far as, you know, you guys are, uh, been around for a while, but, um, let me ask you, Eric, do you have any interest, um, outside of Dead Horse Trauma, like producing other bands or writing, um, writing with other people, or even ever bringing in outside writers, um, to write for, um, Dead Horse Trauma? I mean, we're, there's a couple different things there. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of different types of interests as far as like, you know, working with other musicians, um, you know, I do some booking for, for other bands. Oh, wow. Okay. And, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, we got a project we're working with right now. His name's Eli Dykstra. Okay. You should check him out. He's a 15 year old uh, guitar phenom, dude. He's, he can play, he can shred more than like 90% of the guitarists out there that, what's, that what's I his, know. What's his name? Eli what? Eli Dykstra, D Y K S D R A. I'll check him out. Okay, okay. Oh, well, that that's cool. And um, so I how did thirsty, you know? Okay, and how did and, and how did you get into booking? I mean, I, I imagine just being in the business, but um, how was that something that you wanted to do? Just um, you saw a lot of bands that you thought had, you know, wanted to help expose or what? Well, people, we do a lot of our. We ended up doing a lot of our own booking, you know, and yeah. uh, you know, I'm all about building relationships with the the, the, the bar owners, the promoters, yeah. people like that. So in that's pretty much what a booking agency agent does. Yeah. Um, you know, I talked to talked to our booking agent, and you know, he's like, "Why don't you do it?" You know, like here to help, you know, do some of this stuff, and you know, because it was, I, I was the one locating things yeah. and finding the information to give to him, so he yeah. could just do that, and then you know, so we ended up kind of working with him to to work on more of a sales pitch. You know, like I'm um I'm a salesman, yeah. you know, by trade. Like I've been I've been in sales since I was eighteen years old. I've been, you know, a sales trainer, you know, teaching people like how to how to handle those kind of things. So that's basically what booking agent booking a booking okay, agency okay. is is you're selling a band to, of a, course, of to course. a promoter. Now let me ask you, um are you doing um a dead horse trauma full time or like a lot of musicians, are you kind of a working guy but has a day job? <laughs> well I, it's um it, it, it is in itself as a, as a full-time job. I'd imagine you know, so. Me, That's kind of why I was um, asking. Yeah. Done there. yeah, yeah. But um, no, I, I own a screen printing business. Oh. I do a lot of a lot of artwork. So yeah, um, I have a clothing line that I've been neglecting for a long time. Well, with that, do you do you um? I would assume um, do you use that business or anything to like um, print up any of the band's T-shirts or merch or anything like that, or do you keep that all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All the opening bands that we play with, you know, I usually hit them a card, oh, you know, that wow. kind of thing, and. You know, we, we print. We're, we're musician friendly prices, things like that, because we know what what bands need. You of know, course, being, uh, yeah, being in the being business. A band on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That wow. was the, one of the major things, and why I got into that industry is because we, we tried to get a bunch of shirts printed through other people, and it was just like you know they kept messing it up, or the, an order would be wrong, or you know communication would be terrible. And just like you know, how hard is this? You yeah, know, yeah. so I really started looking into it. And, well, you're you're you know, a multi. Like, this better. You're a multi talented guy. I wasn't aware of that. Now let me ask you, Eric. Um, on that note, I was curious. Um, what what were you into first? Like, um, you know, um, doing doing art, like um, drawing and design first, or or you know, even the t shirt designs, that, or um, were you um, more of a musician first? Uh, I'm just a kid with ADHD. Like, I no, like to play guitar. Cool to, I like to write poetry. <laughs> it's cool to have more than one interest, but I'm just I, I, I guess the the point I was trying to make is um, it's kind of cool that you know you got this um, that you're in this band that you know starting to make some headway. You're you know kind of living out that dream, and then. And then you got these other things that you're kind of able to do on the side because of that, and help help some of these other fellow musicians. I think that's a great thing, you know. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. My my band has helped me kind of open doors for for a lot of the other things that I've wanted to do for a long time. So it's kind of like you know, getting into those businesses that are kind of associated mm-hmm. with music because I I love music. I'm gonna be in music till I'm till I fall over and die. Yeah. Or in yeah, kindergarten, yeah. I, they, 
had you write, draw a picture of what you wanted to be when you grew yeah. up, and I drew a picture of myself on a stage. I wanted to be a rock star. Well, how, you know how how cool is that? I mean, I mean, just I mean, again, you, you kind of have a thing for seeing, um, you know, the future that far, you know, in, in advance. And, and I think it's great that you know, like I said, you got your music and you got this other, these other things you're able to do because of it. I mean, even if. Um, even if the band was to end, you know, you know, two or three more years from now, or even five years down the line, I mean, that that's a great legacy to have. That you know, you you have ability at that point. Even if the band only lasts for another five years, let's say, let's hope it lasts longer. But um, even at that point, um, you know, that that's your legacy, and you have, and you can say at that point, a lot of guys are not able to live out their dreams. The fact that you you've been able to kind of do this, even on the scale you've done it, I mean, I, I think it's a great thing. And people, That's a good point. I like that. And people are, you know, uh, to me, success um, success means different things to different people. But like, like I said, um, the, the fact that you're able to kind of um, live out your dream and do uh, do your music and all these other things, it, you know, it, it's got to be a lot better than having a nine to five job and you know, you're kind of your own boss and um, kind of do what you want. It's got to be a great. Um, t- That's success to me, you know. <clears throat> Yeah, I feel pretty successful in some in some areas. There's still no music, there's still no money in it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. someday. Uh, yeah, I mean, but but again, the the um, the name of the band is out there a lot these days, and, and I I think you know a few more years from now, um, you know, a couple more albums un, under your uh, belt. Hopefully, um, you know, sky's the limit. Who who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and now let me ask you, but you talked a little bit about booking um, other bands. Do you ever um, book Dead Horse Trauma or? Because uh, uh, you mentioned you're with another booking agency, but is that something you'd ever want to do, or would you want to keep your band separate? Um, no, I, I book a lot for. Well, I have for before. Like this is kind of a, a new thing. Whenever we we our booking agency got absorbed by satellite touring, is that you know I no longer am able to book our our band. It's, uh-huh. You know, it's a professionalism type of thing. You don't want the the singer of a band reaching out to, to promoters and things, which yeah. I understood. Yeah, so yeah. I always have to try to do it from, from another type of perspective. Uh-huh. You know, I, I'd be like Eric from NBA Agency instead of like Eric from Dead Horse Trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's usually typically how things go. I mean, I got into it because I was booking Dead Horse Trauma, so I have been doing that for a while. Wow, wow, wow. Well, Eric, you know, I really enjoyed talking today. Um, I'd like to give a huge shout-out before we wrap this up to our mutual friend, uh, Shauna O'Donnell, um, thank her for um, hooking me up uh, with you today to interview. Um, oh, yeah, you're right, Shauna. Yeah, so um, anything else you'd like to say, Eric, before we um, end this? Uh, no, I mean, you can check out our, our tour dates and everything at dhttour.com. You can pretty much find our, uh, type in Dead Horse Trauma in Google, and we're the only thing that'll pop up. Okay, and, and, and Eric, I, I think this is going to go up sometime in um, early to mid-March, so once it does, I'll um, I'll let Shauna know, or I can, um, I can uh, message you on your Facebook page, so... Um, we can let you know, and then at that point, you're able to post an interview on any of your sites if you uh, wish to do so. But um, cool. we'll keep in touch, and um, uh, anytime you want to do this, um, um, I'd be more than glad to talk to you again. Right, I appreciate okay. it. Thank you very much. Okay, take care, my friend. Bye bye.